Well, good morning. We're so happy that you chose to worship with us here at St. Michael and All Angels, especially our uh, contemporary community here. I want to invite you to stand to your feet as we begin our worship. joyful during Lent? Yes, we can. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. So let's sing verse 2 together. All thy works. All thy works with joy surround thee. Earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee. Center of unbroken rays. Field and forest spare Oh, 
welcome. We're so glad that you're here as we continue our Lenten journey. For those of you who were with us last week, we started our sermon series last week where we talked about the Last Supper. In a little bit, uh, Father Eric is going to be talking about the Garden of Gethsemane as we go from Thursday night and head into Friday morning. And then um, next week, we're going to come back and talk about Jesus being condemned. All this is part of our Lenten journeys. We walk the way of the cross, headed towards the joy, uh, the full joy of Easter Sunday. Glad you're here with us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day and that chance to come and worship you. We pray that you would help us set aside anything that's distracting us from being fully here and fully available to you. We ask that you would help us to receive from you and to honor you with what we do in this time. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Let us say this prayer together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. He's truly with us this morning. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us, and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we, entre we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no <laughs> sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord.
let's stand together and sing this last verse. lesson this morning is taken from the 14th chapter of Mark. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be dis distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Can you not keep awake for one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into this time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood, stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's great to be back here with you all today. Um, I have been away for a few weeks. Uh, two of those Sundays, I was in Gethsemane. So here we are, a coincidence. I'm going to start today with a little bit of a story from my past. My junior year of high school, um, I had the great privilege to be one of those kids that is way overscheduled. And a typical Friday in the fall looked like this. I would get up about 5.30 in the morning and I would drive to school for basketball practice, which started at 6.30. And then I'd have the full day of school and then after school, marching band practice until it was time for the football game. And then the football game and clean up and all that stuff and then dinner with friends. And about 11 o'clock uh, on a Friday night after a long week of school, I would drive home, which is about 30 minutes. Um, I was new to driving and I was new to staying awake that late. And um, several times on the way home, I was falling asleep at the wheel. Um, one of the times, um, I was confronted by a, a gentleman who was driving who wanted to beat me up because he thought I was, like, purposely swerving and trying to hurt people. 
Two times I was pulled over by the police um, and escorted home. Um, it was a pretty serious problem. And uh, one of the things that I have learned and paid attention to that is that um, it's really important to be awake when you're driving. <laughs> um, I praise God that nothing more serious ever happened, um, but it is something that I pay attention to this day. If I'm really tired, I know um, driving is not a good idea, um, and this will connect in a minute, you'll see. Last week, Father Bob did an excellent job of laying out sort of Jesus's whole ministry and how we get to Jerusalem and what happened at the Last Supper. And if you missed last week, um, his sermon is on the website, on the church website. I commend that to you. Um, watch it. You'll learn a lot if you weren't here last Sunday. Um, and he does such a great job of picking up um, all the pieces that were out there and sort of getting us to this point uh, where we find ourselves in Gethsemane. But one of the things I wanted to do today is I wanted to give us a little bit of context. So Jay's going to help. We're going to have a map I'm going to put up, and I'm going to walk through that quickly so that you can have, oh, it didn't work as good as I hoped, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So <clears throat> the Last Supper happens in the upper room, um, which is right here. <laughs> so after the Passover, Jesus and his disciples walk through the city. This is, by the way, um, sort of the, ci the city as it looks today, right? The Temple Mount looked different. The Dome of the Rock wasn't there, but the temple was there. And they come into, this is the Kidron Valley right here, and this is the Mount of Olives. You can see Mount of Olives up here. This would be a common thing for them to do. Bob mentioned this last week, but when Jesus came to Jerusalem several times during the year, he would often stay with his friends in Bethany, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is Bethany right here. Now, the Mount of Olives goes up. There's an elevation change. And then when you get to the top, you can't see this today if you're there. But just on the other side of the mountain, before you get to Bethany, is the wall. So you actually physically cannot walk from the Mount of Olives to Bethany, as Jesus did many, many times. You'll notice a couple things on here. Uh, Paternostra Church, this is where Jesus taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer. It's on the Mount of Olives. Um, this, uh, Mary's tomb, is, she's buried right there on the Mount of Olives. Um, we'll have some photos in a minute. And where it says Gethsemane Basilica of Agony, we're going to look at that in a minute. That Gethsemane is right there. And this is the Church of the Ascension, the place where Jesus is taken up into heaven uh, 50 days after his resurrection. So this gives you a little bit of context that things are pretty close together. Um, and again, this is a bit how it looks today. Let's go to the next picture. I think this will help us a little bit. If you are standing on the Temple Mount and looking across to the Mount of Olives, um, you'll see the, the church in the front there is the Church of All Nations, this church right here. And inside of that church is the rock where Jesus prayed this passage in Gethsemane. Um, these olive trees that are right here are very, very old. Um, some people say they date back to the time of Jesus. But right behind here, there's a grove of younger olive trees, which is what it would have looked like. Gethsemane, that word itself, means olive, or means oil press, right? So you're on the Mount of Olives, where olives are grown. You can see olive trees here. And so that's why it's named that. And so the Garden of Gethsemane is right here. Mary's tomb is here. Bethany's on the other side of that hill. Uh, the Church of the Paternostra over here where Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer. And the Church of the Ascension is up on the top of the hill. This church, the Church of All Nations, is called that because um, the prophet Joel, uh, this valley is called the Kidron Valley, but it's also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat, one of the uh, interesting things that happens in the Bible. Sometimes things get multiple names. And this particular location, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it, the prophet Joel predicted would be the judgment for all people, all nations. So this is church called the Basilica of Agony, when Jesus prays in agony, uh, the church of all nations. So those connections are there. One more picture. This would be standing right there at the church of all nations, looking across into the city of Jerusalem, the old city. And this is the Kidron Valley here. The Mount of Olives comes up here. Are right, you with me? And as you look at this, there's a couple things I want you to notice. One is this gate right here. This is the beautiful gate or the golden gate. This is the gate that Jesus would have entered into Jerusalem 
triumphantly on Palm Sunday on a donkey. You'll notice that it's sealed, right? In 1451, uh, Sultan uh, Suleiman I uh, sealed this for fear uh, that the Jewish or Christian Messiah would return and go through those gates again. And so um, in front of that is a Muslim cemetery because they have a belief that um, spirits or angels can't kind of go through there. Now, I just mentioned that the Church of All Nations, uh, the prophet Joel understands that that's where the judgment will happen of all nations. But our Muslim brothers and sisters have an interesting tradition as well. You can see the Dome of the Rock just to the right of it there's a little smaller dome right here. That little portico right here, many, not all Muslims, but many believe that at the last judgment day, Ali will be with Jesus to judge all the nations. It's kind of an interesting aside, I think, if you're in that place and you learned about that history that Jews believe right here is going to be the, the judgment time. Uh, maybe Christians do as well. And then our Muslim brothers have that belief right over there. One other thing I'll say about the Golden Gate as it pertains to Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives and Jesus is King David, after he began to build Jerusalem, and his son Absalom was coming to uh, take him out. And David leaves Jerusalem through the eastern gate. This does happen to be the eastern side. Um, on a donkey. And up through the Mount of Olives. And so there's a strong connection with uh, King David that when the Messiah would return, he would, of course, enter into the eastern gate. And so that, I think that gives us some context for why Jesus is doing kind of all the things he's doing. Would you go back to the picture before and you just leave it up on that one? Thank you so much. That's perfect. So I mentioned er earlier how tired I was as a junior in high school, but I uh, also remember that uh, the people in Jesus' day would have gotten up with the sun. Uh, this time of year, it's about 5 a.m. when the sun rises. And as Bob mentioned last week, a Passover, you know, the sacrifice about three o'clock in the afternoon and the meal begins about seven and goes on for four or five hours. So let's say about 11 o'clock at night, um, Jesus and his disciples who've been up since five um, walk down the mountains and they walk up into the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says to all of his disciples, sit here and wait for me and I'm going to go pray. And then he takes Peter, James and John with him and they go a little further and he says, stay awake. Um, and he tells them he's deeply, deeply grieved, even to the point of death. Keep awake. Keep awake. And then he goes to the place where the rock and he kneels down and prays. It makes sense that Jesus would be tired at this point. But if you don't know the rest of the story, why is Jesus deeply grieved? Is it because he knows what he's going to face personally the next day? The agony he's going to face, the um, humiliation, the pain, the physical pain. Um, is it because he knows that in just a few hours, all of his closest friends are going to abandon him? One of his closest is in the process of betraying him. I imagine that Jesus knew all of this, but he also knew more, right? He knew that this wasn't the end of the story. He knew that even though all of his friends would be scattered and would betray and abandon him, that they would be united again after his resurrection. He tells them, I'm going to go ahead of you to Galilee to meet you there. So while he is in agony and he goes to pray, he goes and kind of throws himself down and, and, and says this prayer, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. And yet, not my will, but yours be done. Not what I want, but what you want. And the story tells us that he, he prays this prayer in, in great agony and anguish, and then he goes back to check on Peter, James, and John, and they're sleeping. And the story's so quick, but it actually happens three times. So imagine uh, at midnight, Jesus comes back, and they're asleep. And he goes, stay awake. I need, I need you. I need your support. I'm in, I, I have to do this by myself, but I, I don't want to feel like I'm alone. Please, I need you. Stay awake and pray. And he goes away and he prays some more and he comes back there asleep again. Three times. Midnight. One, two. Imagine how difficult it is in our own lives when we know we have to face something ourselves, but we really desperately need our friends and family to support us through it and to feel like they're not there. That's a really, really tough thing. Um, I think uh, there's a profound spiritual lesson for us 
about not falling asleep when God needs us uh, to be awake and to be active. And so Jesus is praying during this time this profound prayer of trust. God, not what I want, but what you want. And I wonder, um, I don't mean this as a slight, but I wonder um, if any of us uh, feel comfortable sort of saying that prayer. I wonder if any of us have a a deep enough sense of our own vocation, our own calling in our life, uh, that we might offer that prayer to God. If you've never spent time in real discernment, like, God, what are you calling me to do or be or be with or how to live in this world? I mean, I commend that to you as a project, just in your faith journey right now. Um, find a group of people to get together, maybe a spiritual director. Um, start listening for, for how God is calling you. I think what you'll find is um, if, if you engage in that process, you're going to hear some things that might be difficult to hear. You might hear some things like God calling you to leave things that are comfortable and to go into places and conversations and relationships that are more difficult than you're used to. I think if you go through that intentional process of discernment, God may call some of you to a mission field that you haven't ever thought of or been exposed to. Imagine if you go through that process, you might um, hear some words from God that uh, scare you. And in those moments, when we have a real, true, abiding sense of what God is calling us to do in our lives, we need other people to help and support us through that. And when we really, truly know what that is, sometimes we just don't want to do it. Um, so I've heard this prayer um, used uh, sort of in, an, in a more simplistic way. Like, uh, I know couples who are pregnant, and the dad will pray something like this. Um, Lord, please let us have a son, but not my will. Yours be done, right? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. But what if you knew through a process of discernment and you been praying about this for a while, and you've been meeting with friends and family and the Christian community and a spiritual director, what if you knew that God was calling you to confront your boss's racist behavior? And that if you did that, and when you did that, it might cost you your job. Then that prayer takes on a whole new meaning, right? Isn't there somebody else that can do this? No, God's calling you to do it. And so this prayer of God, I'd I'd like for this cup to not be mine. I want someone else to do this, but not my will, but yours be done. And there's hundreds of examples like that when we enter a process of discernment and really hear God calling us to things. Some of the things that we might be asked to do are are really difficult or scary. Well, Jesus is is no different than us. Even if he knows all things are going to work out fine, he knows he's still got to go through this. And so his prayer is one of profound trust in God the Father, that God's going to make this okay. Even if he has to go through this agony and anguish and death and humiliation, um, that God is going to make it right in the end. I think because of that, he is able to handle what happens in his betrayal and arrest uh, in a really amazing way. And um, what happens, uh, as we've seen, you know, about 3 o'clock in the morning or so, um, here comes Judas with a whole bunch of people with clubs and swords And Jesus has said, just like Bob shared with us last week, he's been there every day in the temple teaching, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Nobody's done anything to him. And here they are in the middle of the night coming to arrest him like he's a bandit. And we don't get all these details from from Mark's gospel. We get them uh, from other places. It's Peter who pulls out a sword and he cuts off the ear of, the guy's name's Malchus. He's the servant of the high priest. And what I think is the most profound witness to Jesus's Um, compassion uh, and his love for us is that in the middle of all of this drama, he takes the time to heal that servant. The guy who's come to arrest him, he he puts his hands on him and he heals his ear. We get that in Luke's gospel, right? And I just think it's a tremendous example of who Jesus is. And as Bob would say, there's a whole sermon right there, (laughs) right? For another time. So they come to arrest him and Jesus uh, is betrayed by Judas with a kiss And the details, it's so quick in Mark, all of the disciples scatter. Not one of them. They all run away. Um, Well, I think we'll hear a little bit next week. Peter's going to go up to Caiaphas' house, which is up closer to the upper room. He's going to deny him three times, as Jesus has predicted. And all of them leave, including this really interesting young man who's wearing a linen thing and kind of runs away naked. That's John Mark, most scholars think. That's the author 
That's the guy who's going to travel with Paul, and he's going to end up in Rome with Peter. It's a very important uh, person in the early church. So there's a little editorial note. Why would anybody put that in there? It's because it's himself. He was there. He was present. So when we read the Gospel of Mark, we can read it with the authority that there's a firsthand witness here who's, who's here, at least for the arrest of Jesus. I can't really imagine what it would be like to be betrayed uh, and abandoned and uh, deserted by every, you know, by my closest friends. But I think all of us have it at one time or another, or we will have an experience of betrayal. And it's one of the hardest things that we can go through. I think knowing it's going to happen doesn't make it any easier. Uh, it wouldn't have made it any easier for Jesus, I don't think. And I think that in the midst of this story of Gethsemane, of all the things that happen, um, there's a lot of examples for us to take on about how we can pray and trust in God our Father and um, even take time in the midst of those difficulties to offer love and compassion to those who are our enemies, those who would come after us to arrest us and to take us away. I want to close just with a few thoughts about what it means to be in the Holy Land today um, in these places. Um, if you have been there, uh, I imagine that you have a similar experience that I've had the, the couple times that I've been there. And if you've not been there, um, it's definitely worth your time to figure out a way to go. Um, when you go to a place like Gethsemane today, um, you're not going to be by yourself. It's not going to be two in the morning, right? by yourself and praying. You're going to be surrounded by a lot of people. Jerusalem is a busy and active city. But if you go in those places and walk in the footsteps that Jesus has walked, just like we are doing through this sermon series, it will give you a, a greater sense of who Jesus was and make these stories come alive. These things really happened in this place um, a long time ago, but they were done for us. Um, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you great thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who walked the way of sorrows, who carried the cross, who suffered betrayal and agony in Gethsemane, and yet his faith in you never wavered. Lord, when we find ourselves in times when we feel like we're going to have to do something difficult, help us to remember his prayer. Not what I want, Lord, but what you want. Help us to be comforted by the promise that even in times where we feel abandoned and betrayed, Lord, you will never leave us, that you love us, and that you will always restore things to your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we respond to God's call in our life, I invite you to stand and join with Christians through the ages as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. O oh, gracious Lord, may your church be a home for the weary 
a shelter for the fearful, a strength to the weak, a place of healing and forgiveness to the troubled and the guilty. We pray for all who are spiritually hungry, for all who have lost faith or who have lost hope. Lord, let your light shine. In our hearts and in your world. Lord of life, we pray for all without adequate food or shelter, all who do not have a home to call their own. We pray for all who have no one to care for them. Lord, let your light shine. In our hearts and in your world. We come to you, Lord of love. We give you thanks for our homes and loved ones. May we not take their love for granted. In loving each other, may we learn of your love for us. Lord, let your light shine. In our hearts and in your world. Loving Lord, we pray for families where there is misunderstanding, neglect, or violence. We remember all who are caring for loved ones who are ill, for those parted from their loved ones due to sickness. Lord, let your light shine. In our hearts and in your world. Lord, in love, you welcome us home. You come to meet us and lead us to your kingdom. We pray for all who have the joy of your near presence. Lord, let your light shine. In our hearts and in your world. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. You will go ahead and grab a seat. Again, good morning, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If you, we want to welcome everybody, but if you're a first time guest, we really want to welcome you and invite you to make this your spiritual home as we walk on this journey together. And uh, to that end, if you want to get our weekly email and learn about all the different opportunities to grow here, make sure you grab one of those communication cards. Looks like this one right here. And just uh, give us the information on the front, and put it in the plate when it comes by in a few minutes. Also, for everybody, if you'd like the clergy to pray for you, we consider it a great privilege and honor to do that. Give us your prayer request on the back of that card and put it in the plate when it comes by. We pray for those on Tuesday mornings when we gather. And again, we, we consider that a great privilege to, to engage in that ministry and pray with you and join you in praying for that. There are a couple of announcements I want to point out. There's a bunch in the, in the Sunday news and what have you that you can see. But we've got a blood drive coming up next week. And um, I got an email late in the week saying the sign-up has been really slow and that they have a great need. So if you're willing and able, I would encourage you to consider giving blood next week. Go to the website or, or call Diane Boyd at the church, and she'll give you all the connections you need on that. Yeah, you, I think you can do it right after this service if you have a, an appointment set up. They're going to be just out here in this parking lot with the blood mobile kind of thing. So I um, encourage you to, to think about um, doing that. I also want to mention this week, for those of you who've signed up, is the week we're going to be serving at Austin Street Shelter or Center. And um, all the arrangements for that are, are set up. So just a reminder to you if you've signed up. And if you didn't sign up but you still want to engage, we're looking to get um, all the personal toiletries that you might take from your hotel, which they're free to take. We're, we're not confessing that one. 
Um, if you've got those ones, if you've got some of those, that's one of the things that they're looking for. You could drop that by the church office. We'll take those on Wednesday when we go down to serve. If you've got questions about that, Colleen's around here somewhere, and right there, you can get with her. She'll um, give you all the information that you need. We come now to a time of Holy Communion, following the pattern that people have done since the very start um, after Jesus' ascension of gathering on the first day of the week to remember what he did and to celebrate this meal that took place that we talked about last week. If you're a guest and you're wondering how it works, look at the screens at the end of the communion prayers. You'll get all the instructions that you need. The very final announcement is if you want someone to pray with you today, we have a trained prayer minister that will be available over here on that side from the time of communion on. Walk back there. Let them know what you want prayer about. They'll do the rest. Great blessing. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. invite any of our little ones who want to come up and have a front row view. Come on up. We've got a place for you. Eric just got you a place. Come on up. Here you go, Colin. Got a place for you right here. Come on up, guys. Anybody else? Come on up. Any parents that feel like they need to come, you can come as well. We'll take all the crowd control we can get. Awesome. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation. But we turned against you and betrayed your trust. We turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, we are sinners in your sight. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, he reconciled us. By his wounds, we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the high. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the high. The congregation would be seated as we continue in prayer. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper... He took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. They're almost going to be gone. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. 
You guys will turn to your seats and come back with your parents and grandparents. Just live for gracious Lord.
to stand as we pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with the spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. So glad you joined us today. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next week.